we're starting again with time. Yes, I just I just did that. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Enjoy Success podcast, where we we explore success, real success, defined as having a life rich in the things that matter most: happiness, gratitude, contribution, health, and love. We interview people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds, careers, ages, etc. But the one thing they have in common is that they have created an extraordinary life for themselves. And through their stories, insights, successes, and failures, you will see that regardless of circumstances, we all have the power to create a life we truly love. I'm your host, Jeff Bayetto, and if you're serious about your own personal growth and creating a life you truly love, this is the podcast for you. Enjoy Success is dedicated to bringing you the most holistically successful people on the planet, not only to inspire you with their own stories, but to share their secrets on how you can literally create the life of your dreams. So make sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss any of our episodes. My guest today is Brian Bogert. Brian is a performance coach, motivational speaker, business strategist, top sales professional, and philanthropic leader. His purpose in life is to awaken the sleeping giant within all of us and to help us grab what we believe is just out of our grasp. Brian is a heart surgeon with a, without a blade. He does not start outside with what you need to do. He starts inside with who you are. In a world that is disconnected, Brian is revolutionizing how individuals, leaders, and entrepreneurs deeply connect with their authentic selves to achieve the best version of themselves. As a human behavior and performance coach, speaker, and business strategist business, Brian disrupts the normative approach of how to create sustainable growth and lasting change personally and professionally. His philosophies on how to embrace pain to avoid suffering, people before profits, and who before what have helped individuals, companies discover and activate their limitless potential. Brian and his team lead with intentionality as they are driven by their vision to impact a billion lives by the year 2045. What I love about Brian is he's the real deal. From a life-changing experience at the tender age of seven, Brian has been on an amazing journey of self-discovery. He is one of those rare individuals who is not out to change the world because it's a cool thing to say, but rather because he knows at a cellular level that this is what he was put here to do. He effortlessly combines inspiration with practical application. And I promise that if you really listen, if you absorb even a fraction of what Brian shares, your life will never be the same. So buckle up. This is going to be a good one. It's an absolute honor to have him with us today. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Jeff, happy to be here, brother. You just gave me goosebumps, bro, when you just uh, gave your little perspective on the end there. That's way better than any bio. And man, that's uh, that, I felt that. That hit me right in the heart. Thank you very much. Beautiful. It's just scraping, uh, obviously, a little bit of, of who you are. But uh, I always consider it something important to make sure people get a sense of just the power of of who's uh, going to be sharing with them for the next hour or so. So thank you for that. And we'd like to jump right in. Can you share your definition of success with us, please? Joy, freedom, and fulfillment holistically in life. Yeah. We're going to wrap it up right there. I just want everyone to listen to that <laughs> over and over. And let it go all the way in. Uh, so walk us through again. This is, I would always love to hear. That's beautiful, super powerful. Can you share again, when did you kind of land on that? What was the journey to get there if it took, if it was a journey and kind of walk us through a little bit of, of that? Yeah, that first answer will probably be the shortest one you get the rest of the interview. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's very clear and, uh, and, and, it, it, and it took a long time to get there. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to start with, with really the story that a lot of people are starting to know me by, but those in your audience may not. And so I have to start there and then I'll give you a little bit of a quick path to get there because no, success did not always have that definition for me. Um, that's actually been something that's probably been really intentionally formed over the last five to 10 years, uh, but it took me a long time to get there, brother. When I was seven, uh, I went to a local Walmart with my mom and my brother to get a one inch paintbrush to finish a house project we were working on. And as we were headed to the car, anybody who's known me for more than about two and a half seconds knows I've always had excitement for life. I was the first one in the car. I was there, I was ready. I was getting ready to get home and put that paintbrush to use. And this was back in the days, brother, before there was key fobs. So I had to literally wait for my mom to catch up, reach into her purse, grab the keys, stick them in the door, turn them so that we could go on with our way. And as I'm standing there waiting, a truck pulls up in front of the store and the driver and middle passenger park and get out. Passenger all the way to the right feels the truck moving backwards. So he did what any one of us would do. Scoot over, put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up on the steering wheel, up on the dashboard. And before you know it, he's catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at me with no time to react. We were parked in an end spot. So he goes up and over the median, up and over the tree in the median, hits our car, knocks me over, runs over me diagonally, tearing my spleen, leaving a tire track scar on my stomach and continuing on to completely sever my left arm from my body. August 10th, 1992, 6, 10 PM, 115 degree day. My mom and brother watched the whole thing happen. They look down, they see me laying on the pavement. They look up and they see my arm laying 10 feet away. 
Fortunately for me, my guardian angel also saw the whole thing happen. And I can never tell this story without honoring this woman because I'm forever indebted to her because when she walked out of that store and she saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her, she could have chosen to just turn her head and go on her day, but instead she chose to go into action. She came over, she stopped the bleeding on the main wound, saved my life. And then she instructed some innocent bystanders to grab a cooler, fill it with ice and put their detached limb, get my detached limb on ice to give me a fighting chance of having a reattached limb. And so Jeff, if it wasn't for this woman, I either wouldn't be here with you today or I'd be here today with a cleaned up stump. That's just the reality. And what I love that you said in the very part of the intro and what the theme of this show is, which integrates so much to the way that I view the world is, I am sure that a majority of your audience had no idea it was going here today. But I've also learned in all this time that although I have an extremely unique story, every single one of us does. And so it's about learning how to pause long enough to become aware of the lessons we can extract from our stories so that we become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. And we all have the ability to do that. We also all have the ability to tap into the collective wisdom of other people's stories to shorten our own curve to learning. That's where we tap into collective wisdom. That's where we tap into collective impact. And so I know we'll hit on some of those core lessons, but to answer your question very specifically, I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I had a lot of armor that I developed over years, which we'll dig into different pieces as to why and how. I was very conditioned by what the world told me I should want the things that I would chase. And I accomplished a lot of that. And so for me, my old definition of success used to be financial success only. Now, joy, freedom, and fulfillment, there is a piece for financial in that. So by no means am I in any way going to say that I'm vilifying money at all. But for me, at one point, it was just about the money and just about the financial security and just about the things that it would allow me to buy to be able to allow myself to feel good to live inside the world that the world told me I should wanna live inside. And so it's taken years for me to shed those layers, but that's a little quick entree into who I am. And I know we're gonna go a lot deeper than that. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I've heard the story several times that gives me goosebumps every time you share it. I just, uh, being a parent, thinking of what that could have been, you know, like how random and, and unexpected certain things seem to be in life and just a normal, everything changes. And, and then just, again, the journey that that, uh, so thank you for sharing that. And I, I appreciate everyone having that as a context. Um, you also, in, in part of your bio, which I love about you is you don't focus on, again, this seems to be really kind of a, a deeply held aspect and pillar of your work is on what people need to do, but, but really more of who they are. Can you kind of just, so how did that, how did seven-year-old Brian and then the, the, the next De couple decades lead you to really clarifying not external all internal or more yeah. starting from the internal yeah you know that's a really great question in fact i'm not even sure anybody's ever asked me that before believe it or not i don't think anybody's asked like when did the shift happen from external to internal um you know at the end of the day when i was a little kid i put up armor very very quickly and i'll expand on that a little bit later depending on where this conversation goes but I created a very strong mental narrative to protect myself, which was that I'm good, I'm strong, I'm capable, I can do anything myself, right? And I didn't really have the ability to completely understand all of the variables that were gonna allow me to become who I was. And the reality of it was as well, is that when you're seven years old and you have a limb literally removed from your body, the amount of physical pain that exists in that type of scenario is something that many won't ever have the chance to understand. And, you know, it's interesting because I reflect back and I hear my mom tell stories about what the surgeon was telling her and my dad way back when about what the seven year old, what their son was experiencing from a pain perspective and what they were prescribing me to just be able to maintain in that time. But when you get yourself into a position to protect yourself and you're dealing with that amount of pain, it doesn't matter what situations we are in life. When the demands of our environment exceed our ability to cope, we either adapt, shut down or spin out, Right. The reality of it is I adapted in many ways, but I shut down the pain and the ability to feel it because it was the only way I could cope. What I didn't realize is that when I shut off physical pain, I also shut off emotional pain. I also shut off mental pain. I also shut off spiritual pain. And I didn't start actually reconnecting with any of those elements for probably another 15 to 20 years. And it was 25 years before I really understood the emotional piece that was completely numbed just for the sake of survival. And so I came out of college, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, wanting to climb the corporate ladder, making a ton of money, right? Taking over the, taking over the world is essentially what I would have told you at 21 years old. I'm going to go help a lot of people. But at that time, it was kind of misguided. And it was always done through just climbing the traditional structure. 
had lots of opportunities early on, but I also got hit multiple different times in different scenarios where I just was constantly reminded that one, the power of our narratives can really bite us. Mine did multiple times. Two, I really hadn't focused on human connection in a really powerful way, right? Again, when I was armored and I was guarded, although I wanted to connect, I didn't really know how. And my own force field to protect myself didn't really let people come in. And so I shifted a little bit towards human connection and vulnerability and authenticity, which are kind of the glue to human connection. I think vulnerability is the antidote to armor. And so when we can actually start to put ourselves in that position, we start to see what connection can really look like. And so it was around that time. I, I, I'll finish this real quick because I have a question and I want to I let you ask that. But it was around that time when I really started to focus on this idea of connection that I started to actually go inward. And so that was probably about 10 years ago. And we'll expand on that further. I know you had a quick question. Yeah, well, I'm curious what the narrative, like, so looking back, what was the narrative? What was the narrative that you were living from? Yep. And then, and then as you, was it a, gen, was it a small tweak to the connection or was it, did you feel like there's a huge pattern in it? Oh, it was dramatic and it was a quick shift. Um, the narrative was literally the mental one that I had created, which was, I'm good, I'm strong, I'm capable, I can do anything myself. And that came really in two primary areas. One, when I was seven years old and I've got my arm in a sling and I've got a teddy bear in between to keep it 90 degrees because it needed to for the bone to heal. I got very used to seeing jaws hit the ground, awe on people's faces when they would say, hey, what happened to you? And all of a sudden they're expecting me to say, hey, I fell off my bike. I, I fell off the jungle gym. Man, I leaped off that swing and I beat the other kid. But every single time, just deadpan, I'd look him in the face owning my own truth, which was I was over by a truck and my arm was torn in. And immediately what would happen is 95% of adults would pause. They would not know how to process. And they'd look immediately to my parents for validation. They didn't believe my own truth. Mm. And so I stopped really caring to try to justify or convince them. And then the second thing that would happen by those other 95% of people was they were viewing me through their lens of what they'd be capable of in my scenario and immediately limiting me. What I could or couldn't do, how I was going to live, what I'd be capable of. Can I tie my shoes? Can I play sports? Can I drive a car? Can I ride a bike? Like literally everybody was like, oh, well, he's probably not going to be able to do that ever again. I refused to buy into that narrative. And so I created my own. I'm good. I'm strong. I'm capable. I can do anything myself. That served me very, very well for a long time because I, I do believe, and we hear this all the time, right? If you have a good mentality, if you've got a good mindset, you can do anything. It's only part of the equation, just to be clear. But I used to believe it was the whole equation. And so that's all it was. I went up here. And I just recently heard a quote from Michael Singer. And he said, the mind is the soul's place to go to hide from the heart. Mm. I genuinely probably was experiencing so much pain internally that I wasn't actually acknowledging or paying attention to that it was easy to live up here. And overperform by what I could constantly do to break people's expectations. And then at 20 years old, I'm in college, I'm a junior, and I go snowboarding. I go down, I re-break my left arm, and immediately go through seven surgeons over the course of the next 10 months, no ability for them to understand how to process and heal me because my arm has a traditional and or non-traditional and anatomical structure. And so finally I reconnect with my surgeon that actually did my primary surgery surgeries. And he went in and did all the soft tissue work so the orthopedic could go back in and repair the bone. But I almost lost my arm again. And at any moment over the course of 10 months, because there was a loose bone hanging in there, I could clip a nerve, I could clip a vein, I could clip any of these one things. And during that 10 months, that's when I realized the power of our narratives and that mine had failed me. Because I had lots of friends, I had lots of people, lots of connections in my world, but nobody was there. And oh, by the way, I'm not in any way upset that nobody was there because it wasn't their fault, it was mine. They bought into the narrative I'd created and they believed Brian was good. He's strong. He's capable. He can do anything himself. And if he needs help, he'll ask for it. But what I hadn't actually done at that point was put myself in a position where I could have the vulnerability or the courage to ask for help when I needed it most. And so it was that 10 month period where I went into honestly a pretty deep depression. I put on 40 pounds in that period of time. I was just eating my feelings and realizing through those periods of isolation and being disconnected deeply from myself and from others that this wasn't going to be a way that was going to serve me for the rest of my life. I was given a gift at 20 because I could have maintained that path for another decade, but I didn't. And so that's when I turned deeply into human connection and really started to focus on how do I bring my own walls down? How do I establish vulnerability? How do I establish authenticity so that I can really show people who I am, what I'm all about, how I'm going to connect. And oh, by the way, just because I turned into that and it was a dramatic shift, that does not in any way mean that I perfected it. And it took a long time to even realize that even my attempts there we're still a little bit empty compared to what they are today. 
Beautiful. You know, and I just want to put a button in this. You said uh, you realized that that the uh, kind of the story, the narrative you were telling yourself was only part of the equation, that mindset that, and can you just, so how in your words do you just fill out the rest of the, the formula? What is? Yeah, so human connection is what led me down the path, but it wasn't the other piece of the equation. Um, yeah. You know, as I focused on human connection, if I'm being completely honest at this point in my life, I did it from a strategic and tactical perspective. Mm -hmm. I did. I understood the concepts. I understood how to ask the right questions. I understood how to share just enough to get other people to drop their armor. And then I could enter into their world with full force semi truck behind it while still maintaining my own, right? I could still control how much I shared and how much I operated. And my wife forever used to say, Brian, you don't, you don't really feel like you don't have emotions. And I'd, I'd like react and I'd be like, what are you talking about? I feel like, I feel a ton inside, right? Like just inside my narrative was I felt a lot, but I didn't necessarily come across and so she always described me as sympathetic and mm -hmm. I never quite understood that because I was like no, no no of course I understand and then I'm laying on the couch with my daughter when she's about two years old and this was I got about five six years ago and we'd just gotten done playing and having so much fun like so much fun and connecting and we lay down on the couch and she puts her arm around my neck and she rolls back and she kisses me on the cheek and she says I love you dada and I just start crying and I got goosebumps when I say that because I, tears don't come easy to me. I wish they did. Uh, I truly wish they did because I have, there's no shame in tears. And in fact, I think it's one of the coolest things ever when I see a man cry because it shows that they're comfortable enough in who they are that they can demonstrate that to the world, even though they've told us that that's not how we can operate as men. But I was conditioned so long to shut it off that I'm still learning how to actually allow it to bubble up into the full experience. But when I cried in that moment, it was really clear to me that I hadn't ever experienced joy in that full perspective ever before. One time actually in reflection was on the day of my wedding, I was a blubbering idiot and there's not a good picture because I do not have a pretty cry face. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because I was terrified. It's because I was so happy, but I hadn't experienced joy that way at that time. So I thought it was like stress or anxiety or whatever on my wedding day. No, it was pure joy. Right? So twice in my life up until that point, I had experienced joy to tears but then it made me realize, hey, wait a minute, if I've not experienced joy this way, I haven't experienced fear, guilt, shame, scarcity, any of the other things on the other side, and everything was a little bit dulled in perspective. So this prior period focusing on human connection, I started to realize, again, there was a fault in the way that I approached it because human connection without emotion isn't really human connection. Mm, beautiful. And so then I started to go really deep in myself and started to recognize very quickly over the course of that next year how much I was unconsciously, actively suppressing so many feelings. And if I could just pause long enough to let it well up just a little bit more each time, just a little bit more each time, just a little bit more each time, right? Until all of a sudden I could let it just be here and feel it in my chest and allow my mind and heart to connect. That is what the true equation is. I believe that we are all hardwired either intellectually or emotionally. That's not to say that we don't all have both. We all have both. We're hardwired to lean one way first. And so what we have to do is start to understand our mental, our intellectual, and our emotional narratives. And we have to balance and regulate between the two because they both lie to us and they both are not always accurate based on what's in front of us or where we need to head. So it's true that we need to allow ourselves to receive both narratives so that we can truly see ourselves more clearly so we can move faster with less effort. And those that reach the highest level of performance are not those that just have a good mindset. There's those that are deeply connected and have done the work to complete that 18 inch journey from their head to their heart. It's really well said. Can you talk a little bit? I've heard you share, and I think you do it a really good job of how much is unconscious of um, just our, <clears throat> our experience and, and then how we start to create a little bit of space so that we can respond instead of react. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to say, because to your point, I think it's really, it's really important for us to recognize that so many of us have felt like victims. So many of us have felt like life is fate. So many of us felt like we don't have influence or control over our destinies. And it, it actually, like, in so many ways makes sense when you start to understand the science behind it as well. I'm a big believer in art and science. They're blended. I'm a big believer in Western and Eastern philosophies blended in so many categories. And I'm going to just embed this in here too, because so many things in this world are polarized and politicized and designed to separate us. And often I believe that the gift is actually in the gray area. Yeah. And so if we recognize that, then focus on the science that's around this, right? 
Our minds process 11 million bits of information per second, but we're only consciously aware of about 40. So what that says is that we largely live in the unconscious. So until we go through a systematic process of moving the unconscious to the conscious, the unaware to the aware, we're gonna feel like victims, we're going to feel like fate, we're gonna feel like we have no influence or control over destinies. But that is why I often say in the very first place that we start is this concept of really putting ourselves into a position where we can actually raise our levels of awareness because we can't be intentional with what we're unaware of. And I got into this debate with my team in an offsite about two weeks ago because they started to say, well, Brian, is it, does awareness always lead or does intentionality lead to become aware or vi 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 vice versa? And I was like, whoa, whoa, chicken to the egg situation, right? But at the end of the day, what we ultimately landed on is the only way you can be intentional to raise your level of awareness is if you have some level of awareness that you need to raise your awareness. So awareness typically is what's going to start. And so for anybody who's feeling like they aren't connected, they aren't actually doing the things that they want, they aren't deeply fulfilled by the way that they're living, they aren't energized by the people, situations in life that they're living, start by raising your level of awareness so that you can become intentional where you need to. And what we know is that perspective and pain point us at what's important. So if we start to put ourselves into a position where we understand this, then we can see it clearly. You asked, how do we put ourselves into a position where we can respond versus react? And so there's a little bit more behind this, but I'm gonna hit this at the highest level because one of the things that we really discovered is the things that pe people think keep them stuck is the wrong strategy and tactics in their world, hmm. right? If I buy a seven-step system to teach me how to create a seven-step system to go sell seven-step systems to other people who wanna sell seven-step systems for success, then we can grow and, and learn how to do that, right? We don't need any more seven-step systems for success. We need more internal work for people to really deeply identify with who they are. And so one of the things that we know actually keeps people stuck, not the strategy and tactics, they're critically important, again, for leveraging and scaling your life, but they are not the things that keep us stuck. The things that keep us stuck definitively in working with some of the world's highest performers time and time and time again are a combination of the emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning that exists in our world. And so the triggers are those things that often will transport us to a place that we are no longer right here. There's those things that are so deeply ingrained because of the ways we were raised, the ways that our grandpa and mom and dad and brother and teachers and coaches looked at us, told us things, had embedded messages in our worlds. So that now in today's world, when our spouse says something about how we loaded the dishwasher incorrectly, it has nothing to do with the dishwasher. It has nothing to do with that spouse. It has everything to do with how our grandpa looked at us when we were poor. So how do we put ourselves into a position that we can actually unpack this and really understand how we see ourselves more clearly? And these were created, by the way, from my own personal experiences because of all the triggers that caused me to react and create so much damn damage in my life, right? My wife, for example, being a husband and father is the most important thing to me, hands down, not even a question. It's the only thing binary in my world. And my wife would ask a simple question like, hey, babe, what are we gonna do with kids this weekend? My shame filter would cause me to hear it this way. Hey, Brian, you've not done enough to be a good husband and father here recently. So what are you gonna do to make up for it this weekend since you've been failing here recently? So what would happen? My shame would bubble up and all of a sudden I'd get defensive and I'd react, rattling off the 10 things I'd done in the last four days to show her that I'm a good husband and father when that's not even what she asked. And so often we are in positions as leaders and in life and in families where we don't actually see things clearly for what they are. We react based on what our filters and our triggers cause us to hear or feel. And when we react like that, guess what? We create damage because now all of a sudden my wife's armor has gone up. So we created this inside out process to just simply do this. And this isn't a seven step system for success because it looks different for every person, right? But it's a framework to help you understand how do you progress through this? I believe that we all need to become aware. We need to become aware, again, not coincidental that I said awareness is one of those things that gets us there. We've got to become aware of those emotions or emotions that have impacted our lives and the ways that it might've impacted us, held us back or created damage. Then we've got to own it. Awareness and ownership are two different things. Ownership recognizes that this is you putting yourself in the position to take responsibility for the things that have happened in your life. And what we know about emotional triggers, 99% of the time is they are not your fault, but they become your responsibility once you become aware of them. Well, I want to pause there for just a second because uh, one, I love that. I love that you're on, I uh, love, I love your speed. Um, and everyone's going to have to play this one back, not at one and a half, but point, point 0.5 just to really get, because every single sentence that Brian, it's just laying down, it's awesome. Um, but I want to I wanna just put this, so this, it's not our fault, but it becomes our responsibility. I just, this is, this, this is my, one of my favorite things that you've, I've heard you say is, so it, things happen, age four, age seven, age whatever, and it doesn't have to be necessarily as out, outwardly dramatic as, as what you went through, but we all have a drama that has kind of influenced us and created some sort of uh, unconscious now Yep. way of, of uh, narrative, way of being in the world. And that wasn't our fault. But 
then can you take it and, and jump right back in there? But I just, I think that that was really a beautiful. Thank you for pausing. Yeah. And by the way, interject anytime you want. This is your show. I'm here to serve. And I know I talk really fast. I love I it. I, I'm a fast talker so, too. I, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, awesome. I'm saying you will never offend me by stopping me. So we're good. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that you caused me to stop there because this is one of those areas that took me a long time to understand because I would shame myself for the things of which I had no control or awareness around. And so when we recognize that just to your point, right? I mean, we work with individuals that grew up in a highly competitive household and they were constantly pitted against their, their, their siblings. And so this idea of comparison, this idea of never being enough, this idea of having to live up to somebody else is something that's so deeply ingrained in them, right? I've got clients that I work with where their parents were judges or lawyers or different things that have conditioned these beliefs on who they needed to be, what they needed to do, how they needed to show up in the world. And so it starts getting all these different triggers. I mean, I just spoke at an event last weekend that was called Money Matters. And this whole concept of people's relationship with money is often inherited based on however your parents or their parents or their parents' relationship with money was. So if you operate from a position of scarcity or greed or whatever, right, often you ingrain that, okay? And so when we recognize that most of these triggers are actually passed on generationally, they're inherited and they are conditioned into us, then it's up to us if we decide they no longer fit to take responsibility for how we can change those generational patterns moving forward. And so in this particular case, right, that defense mechanism that I had to defend that I'm a good husband and father, I was blind to that for a very long time. I truly like felt like I was being attacked and I was being misunderstood in those scenarios. And so what would happen? Because I wasn't being seen and understood and I wasn't connected. My armor would go up to protect myself and I would react in those moments. Now, those actions, I could argue, are my fault, but I wasn't aware of them at the time. And so why I say this is once we become aware of them, they become your responsibility. And that's why it's so important in this ownership stage in the inside out, because when you recognize it's your responsibility, when you truly own these pieces, part of ownership is creating repair where we've created damage in our lives. Mm. So beautiful. And I want everyone, I always, uh, when I hear you speak about this too, like responsibility as a word seems loaded at times, right? And I, and I always like to just have this as a reminder for myself and just for everyone listening as well. But Ultimately, it means the ability to respond, right? Mm -hmm. It's not this, it doesn't have this weighted, like it's your, like the, there's fault attached to responsibility. That was your responsibility. But this ability to respond for me has always lightened that experience of like, yep. whoa, I, you said, I felt like I was attacked. Like that, if, if we can't all relate to that, like someone says something, we have a reaction. It felt uh, viscerally. They attacked us. They, they were saying yep. that we weren't a good dad. We were not a good husband. We're not a good. And that was real for us. Now, how beautiful, like, and again, to be able to say, well, what if I could respond differently? Like, what would that? Yep. And then we all of a sudden, what if it could feel different? Now, taking completely, obviously, part of the path to that is, well, that's not what she meant. Uh, that's not at all what she was saying. But even if it was what she was saying, uh, if you knew, if you were being aware of what was true for you, you may or may not have reacted in that exactly. same way again. And there's, exactly. therein lies, I'm just writing it down again, the freedom, there's some sort of part of your definition of success, that freedom starts to mean something more to me as I listen to you share on this. Huge. Yeah, freedom, freedom is a whole variety of things. And I think that to your point as well, our realities are shaped by our experiences that are deeply ingrained because of these triggers behavioral patterns and environmental conditions that we put ourselves in. And so if we recognize that we're experiencing resistance and energy drain, which I'm going to define as any negative emotion, right? So if we're feeling anger, disrupt, unworthiness, isolation, un, uh, myth, lack of understanding, any of these things, there's resistance and energy drain. And again, to me, that's perspective that should point you at what's important. Meaning if you aren't operating as free in the energy and how you flow, if you aren't energized, if you aren't uplifted, recognize where that source of resistance is coming from because that's where you can pay attention. But I also want to expand on something because I haven't actually shared on this piece in a little while, but I'm actually a big believer that the fault responsibility dynamic doesn't just exist for our own. I think that our fault and, and responsibility 
also relates to those people in our lives that we care most deeply about. For example, I am in no way responsible for my wife's deeply ingrained emotional triggers. However, I can choose to be responsible to pay attention to understanding where they are so that I don't trigger her. Because if I understand that our tendency to keep ourselves safe is usually ingrained because of our reaction to these triggers, then I can put myself in a position to, again, raise my level of awareness around the ways that I approach her, the ways I interact, the ways I communicate that might cause her to have herself be triggered or cause her to be reactionary. Yeah. And so for me, it's, and I believe that is true for the associates that work for me and with me. I believe that's true with my business partners. If I can deeply understand where other people triggers lie, then I can choose not to pull them. And, and, and what I'm here, I also want to kind of dive into this because um, I think all, a lot of us can relate. Like we have the same experience over and over, even though different people on the outside change, we're the constant, you know, wherever you go, there you yep. are. But this, this idea of being gentle with someone else's triggers, like often, our spouse, our significant others, the people that we care the most about, we often don't treat them very well. Like, I mean, often we're, yeah. they're, they're triggering us, we're triggering them because we're, we're really invested in that relationship. Yep. So it's, so I'd be curious to hear your take on this. It, it might be part to not trigger them, but it also might be part to be a gentle space for them to get triggered and allow for them gently to be able to move into exploring that it's instead both. of, right? So there's a yep. little bit of, imagine again we love our we love these people more than anything why wouldn't we also want to create and spend the time do the work so that we could be a space for them to be exploring themselves in the same way that you're sharing would be so powerful for us to be exploring a thousand percent agree with you what i'm going to say though is that before we can get there Mm -hmm. we have to do the work on our own triggers so that we can actually maintain a neutral calm open space to be able to hold that space for them And so I'm a big believer that everything begins and ends with us. And I do believe that that's the progression. And that's where my wife and I are at at this point in the game, right? But we both had to do a little bit of our own internal work so that we could recognize those spaces in ourselves so that we can pause in those moments and move through them. And so let me give you the last two steps in Inside Out because then I'll wrap that piece together because this is now where and how we're actually supporting each other, right? The the aware and own, I think that 99% of the population can do. I don't think that everybody does, but they can. And everybody's capable of doing that probably without any outside help. And I wanna be clear that when I say that, that's not in any way to suggest that these next two steps, I'm saying you should hire a coach. Most people aren't ready for a coach either, okay? So I'm going to just tell you what these are, but we've gotta learn to unroot the emotion or emotions that impact our life. What does that mean, right? We need to identify the root or root source or sources of those emotions, right? So we talked about a few different dynamics. Maybe you were pitted against your siblings in the beginning. Maybe you always had to be just right in the way you showed up in the world. Maybe you had to follow the lawyer path, right? The reality of it is, is any one of these things that might be conditioned to you, whether it's shame or fear or scarcity, right? So many of these elements are deeply ingrained in us. Have you ever done weeding, my friend? In a garden? Yeah, weeding, garden, yard, lawn, anything. I have. Okay, so have you ever had to pull one out of hard ground or like maybe the driveway? Yes. And how does that work out when you try to pull it out? Um, I've had uh, varying degrees of success with that. Varying degrees of success. Because typically, right, if it's hard ground or in the concrete, we might get the top of it off. Yeah. And then it's going to continue to grow back, right? Or some people who see weeds in a lawn and they're like, well, if I just mow over it, it'll be green. So it'll be okay. And we just continue to mow over the top on these things, right? The reality of it is, is if we don't actually effectively get the root out, the weed continues to grow. And it's the same thing with our emotions. And so, so often we're taught, right, not to feel, not not to actually express emotion, not to be vulnerable and authentic. Nope, that's not what we want. We want you to shut all that stuff down, shove it down inside your own container and show up with a smile on, move fast because that's what the world wants us to do. I like that analogy because I believe also if you get into the roots, you got to get a little dirty, right? Like this isn't isn't necessarily a super clean, comfortable uh, process. It's the hardest, most uncomfortable work you'll ever do, but it's also... The most meaningful because it has the ability to free you more than anything else in your world. Yeah. And so what I love, and this is what I say, if you continue to mow, the weed continues to grow. But when you finally dig deep enough to get it out, what's left? Not only have you gotten dirty, but you've got a hole. You've got a hole. And that hole gets to be filled with new thoughts, new patterns, new behaviors, new habits, and actually being able to move through these things. But if you don't always get to the root, 
you're never going to move through it. Now, I want to be really clear, even if you unroot it, some of these things are so deeply ingrained that they will be adversaries in constant pursuit for the rest of your life that you'll have to be vigilant in your efforts to stay aware, to stay ahead of them. Now, because I get triggered by shame still almost every single day. But the moments, I exist in moments of triggers now versus minutes, months, or years. Yeah. I've heard the cost of freedom is vigilance, right? Like I've heard that as a, as a saying, and I think that's really beautiful. This is uh, maybe a curriculum if we looked at life as our curriculum, and it just the lessons may get lighter, like a little bit softer. Right. Um, not necessarily that we no longer ever have to experience. You just get triggered less and less and it hurts less and less. It takes right? less time to, to reset. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. I, you know, there's, there's so much, uh, when someone really understands, when someone really understands a process and can speak so eloquently and so profoundly on it, at having really, I love the example of that. And I think people, you know, the mowing or that, like, it's still there. We're all super clear. It's just like, we just, we just hit it. We just chopped it down for a second, but that is definitely coming back. And we all, I think this, the invitation that you offer and that you're going to be offering a billion plus people as you move forward in this is really what you started, which I always love how this always wraps back in joy, freedom, and fulfillment. Like that's, what's on the table. That's it. If anyone, and I think what I, what I love about asking people how they define success and really giving per permission for people to really take a, a moment and make sure that their definition is what matters most to them, not just what society has told us, is because if we get down to it, most of us do want the same kind of thing, deep connection with people we love, a, a purpose and, and being able to share our, our unique gifts and talents and all those things. But when we start to do the work that you're sharing, sure, it's messy, sure, it's dirty, maybe it's not easy, maybe it's uncomfortable, maybe it doesn't work in the beginning, but on the other side is freedom our joy, freedom, and fulfillment. And like, I can't think of a more worthy, noble cause for us to be in pursuit of. Am I capturing a little bit of what you're up to? Dude, you've, you, I, think, I think you've got, you've got me wrapped up in a little bow with a, with a pretty box on it. And I, dude, yes, that's what I'm all about, man. Um, at the end of the day, dude, I've been stuck many, many times. I'll be stuck again, right? Yeah. And so many of us are. And all of us have been there. All of us will be there again, but it's not okay to stay there. And so we have to learn how to move, right? And so that's really that last step. And let me hit that real piece yeah. so that we close the inside out and then we'll just wrap on everything else. But I think it's really important that people hear this last step because this is where it starts to come together. Once you've unrooted it, you have to move. So how does it move through your body? How does it move through your world? And how do you move through it? Okay, so what does that mean? I told you about that one example with shame where I bubbled up and I got defensive and I rattled off my wife. But the same thing, and again, you've probably heard this. I lived in the corporate space for a long time. I talk fast, I'm very loud. Right. We know this. Everybody who's been listening to this up until this point is like, oh, yeah, he's loud. He's fast. He's loud. Right. But I can't tell you how many times people would lean over and say, shh, Brian, you can't talk that fast. You can't talk that loud. And shame would hit me then. Mm -hmm. And I'd immediately shrink down into who I was. I'd start biting my tongue, not feeling like I, who I was was good enough, that my words weren't going to be worthy enough. Both shame moved through my body completely differently. And so, what's important is that when we identify the emotion, we have to start to understand how does it move through our body. I've got a client who deals with anxiety. And she said, oh, I know my anxiety tells. But then when we started to break it down, they looked different at work. They looked different with their parents. They looked different with their husband. They looked different with their friends. But she'd never taken the time to realize that anxiety showed up differently for her in each different category. And until we start to understand how these emotions move in our body and so that we can identify them real time, it's going to be very difficult to understand where we're getting triggered and how to pause in those moments. Because the second piece of movement is how does it move in our world? Meaning, where do we get triggered? Now, I have five or six different ways that shame moves through my body. I have over 60 triggers that I'm aware of. Mm. things that, right, if I'm challenged on a certain thought or if I'm challenged for being a good husband and father or things that are a part of my identity that I view as whole, they can trigger me if I'm not seeing it very clearly. So I've got to be able to identify how it moves in my body so I can start to pattern and match it to where I'm being triggered because it's in those moments that I can move through it because I can pause and ask myself, is what I'm reacting to dealing with what it is right now or is it deep due to my deeply ingrained trigger, right? Where and how do I pause long enough to take a deep breath to center myself so that I can respond instead of react and create damage. And so that's where this whole concept comes together. But that's exactly what I was saying is that it's movement, right? The only way for us to do this is to move. And yes, it's hard. Yes, this is one of the most difficult journeys. But I guarantee you, I know what's on the other side. Mm. And I'm just trying to bring as many people along with me because I know that moved people move people. I just want to yeah. move more people. Move people, move people. And I, I think what's, <laughs> I, that's beautiful. Um, I also want to remind everybody like everything in the entire universe is in motion like we are designed to be moving like this is our natural like our natural state <laughs> is to be moving and I, I think if everybody if we all think about it for a moment 
if we haven't learned a lesson, it's going to keep showing up. Like life is going to keep bringing the opportunity for us to get through something. This is not something you can avoid or you can try, but it's going to show up as a detriment in an illness, some sort of uh, relationship issue, career issue, like some way life is going to get our attention, but there's no way not to participate. We might as well go in uh, as Brian's kind of sharing with a, a framework, with some tools, maybe with a coach uh, and some support, but to really get in there because life is not going to let us not do this. Uh, and so it's like, there's, that's what I love about what you do is like, the reason I totally am bought into a billion plus people being part of your uh, experiences because we're all on, this is, this is universal. Like everyone's on this path to, so I have no doubt that that's going to, that's going to be the reality uh, moving forward. I want to ask you as we, uh, because we ask everybody on a daily basis, are there small things, small actions, little micro habits, little, little things that you found really support you and, and have built muscles in your world emotionally, mentally, Again, is, are there things that we could do on a daily basis and we could yeah. start? Yeah, let me know a couple of those. I'm, I'm gonna give the lowest hanging fruit to everybody because I think it's the most simple one. We just always forget about it. We are given this really beautiful gift called our breath. If we recognize that of all the systems that keep our body alive, all of them work without our intention. We have one that we also can control. And I don't think that's a coincidence. It's our breath, right? We will breathe whether or not we think about it, but we can put intention into our breath. And so I have trust, surrender, breathe tattooed on my arm. I'm not the smartest person in so many ways. I'm very dense. I'm very visual. And I need these constant reminders. And last year, when we unpacked some of the anger in my world, I got this tattoo on my arm because I could realize that in those moments, if I could just trust surrender, let go of what I believe is happening in front of me and breathe, center myself in my breath, that I could move through it. And that's something we all have the ability to do. So I am a big believer in intentional quiet time, intentional breath work, intentional meditation on a regular and consistent basis. However, that's also one of the areas that I actually bring to fruition when people say, hey, what do I do? What's the first thing I do when I get triggered? What's the first thing I do when I notice I get it's some heightened emotion? Pause and take a breath. And the cool part is, is you don't even have to let the outside world know that you're doing it. I mean, I can literally pause here for, I mean, it'll be a longer breath because I talk so fast. You'll be like, wait, he, did he go quiet forever? I mean, literally, it takes that long. And if we put ourselves into a rhythm to do this, we know that it's effective. Now, I also know that there's a four by four breathing me me method, four seconds in through the nose, four seconds out through the mouth. that's been used by the Navy SEALs for decades. And the reason it's been used by the Navy SEALs for decades is because it's the most effective thing at calming the human stress response next to Valium. But guess what? We don't have to take anything to bring ourselves back into center and calm our human stress response. We just have to be aware enough and calm enough to pause long enough to take a few breaths. And so for me, that is one thing, low hanging fruit that I use every single day. I get triggered. I get this. I start getting heightened emotions. I constantly am breathing to just see things for what it actually is versus what my conditions have believed, made me believe it might be. Mm, you know, uh, just in, in your Mo analogy, the, the weed analogy as well, uh, most of us are shallow breathers. Like again, whether we're aware of it or not, it, it's just the top third of our lung that we're filling up. We just do that. And so with an invitation to breathe, we actually realize like, whoa, there's a, there's a lot more space in there, which again is, is, is no coincidence. There's a lot more space. Yeah. And breath is a direct, uh, a direct portal into that. So that's beautifully said. It's also um, one of the ways to most deeply connect with yourself and deeply connect with others. You know, the reality of it is, is it, depending on the room I'm in, if I'm on stage giving a keynote, I will either start the session with a guided breath exercise or I'll close it. Because if we're talking about human connection, what's crazy is when we talk about this collective consciousness, this collective wisdom, this collective energy that we all have access to, you get in a room of 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 people, and you get everybody synchronistically breathing four seconds in, four seconds out, guiding through it. There is literally a connected consciousness that takes place real time in that room. And, and by the way, there isn't a single person in those environments that would deny that that's the truth. Yeah. It sounds crazy for those who haven't experienced it, but that's also another way to deeply connect with those most intimate relationships you have with your business partners, with your associates, with your clients is truly just to center yourself in your breath because that energy right there is an open invitation to be connected with. Mm. It, it's, uh, it's something that I, I I, we hear a lot in various in various ways, but I really like how you're speaking about it. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a concentrated meditation experience over here that we do for 10, 15, 20 minutes. 
it's a in the moment reminder. And, and again, if we were gonna all get a tattoo, uh, putting remember to breathe as a, as a really nice kind of doable thing for us to start the process into everything that you're speaking of, more awareness, and then uh, I'll get the four steps wrong, but awareness, ownership. Uh, unroot and move. Unroot and move, okay. And I think that that is, again, it starts, and once we start, again, it's easy to remember if we, if we can just remember where, we're st where we first step, the next step, okay, well then what do I do next? And that's what I love. Like you have, an, you have a very practical way of speaking about very, very complex topics. And I Thank think you. that's always a great, ex that's just a great testament to a good, a, a really profound teacher is, can I explain something very difficult in a way that I could turn around, I could turn around and explain it to my seven-year-old and it would make sense. So I really appreciate how you do that. Thank um, you. Thank you. As you, as you brought up kind of your, um, your trust render and breathe tattoo, I had noticed also you have this really cool tattoo of a clock on your other arm. Yep, yeah, right there. I, I had noticed that and I was wondering, can you tell, that seems like that has an amazing story behind it. Yeah, it does. You know, I, uh, I I wanted to get a tattoo on my right arm for a long time that symbolized just like the recreation of who we are in any given moment. And so I have the Phoenix bird tattooed on the outside of my arm. And it's because I'm on probably version 89.2 of Brian Bogert. And there is no final destination, only constant evolution of self. So as I was doing this and I was like, well, I really want a full half sleeve. I could do just the outside, but I really wanted to wrap the arm. And so I called my mom because I've always had an affinity for timepieces and I love watches. I love clocks. I love the symbolism of time. And at this point, I love time just as a construct of our society and how we can bend and manipulate and use time to our advantage. I just love the concept of time. And so I had thought I had known the time of my accident, the origin, if you will, but I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I called my mom and I said, Hey, this is what I'm playing with. I think I'm going to fill this on the underside of my arm and What's funny is my mom hates tattoos, but, but she, she like leaned right in. And I said, so if I were going to do this, what time was my accident? I knew the date. It was August 10th. So the date is in here too, but I wanted to know the time. And she said, it's 6, 10 PM. Awesome. And she said, so are you going to do it with a cracked lens? And I paused and I get goosebumps every time I tell this story. Um, I paused and I said, no, mom, why would I do it with a cracked lens? Like literally not even thinking about why that might be her perspective. I just was like so in shock and awe because mine was completely opposite. She said, well, that was the moment life as I knew it stopped. That was the moment life as I knew it paused. And it ingrained my need to put that on my arm because it was the power of perspective real time because I never had seen it through that lens ever. She'd never used those words. She'd never communicated it that way. It was around this time piece that I was able to understand that for her, that's when time froze. And I responded back and said, no, mom, I'm actually going to do it with a completely healthy, good lens. Because for me, that's when my life as I know it began. You see, I don't remember a lot of my life before my accident. In fact, my brain has literally reprogrammed itself so that if I watch home videos of us before I was age seven, where both my arms are completely normal and completely functional, it's weird for me to watch because that's not how I remember. And so for me, it was just such a really powerful way to say, yep, okay, if I'm going to show the constant reinvention of myself, I'm going to show that there's no constant evolution or no, de no final destination, only constant evolution. Then the reality of it is the power of perspective brings that all to fruition because that also shows that time is all about perspective. Time is a construct and it's really a byproduct of how we see the world and the lenses with which we view it through. And so whether your lens is cracked or broken or your lens is completely open, the reality of it is, is that's an indicator for your experience. But it also is a reminder to meet people where they are because you never quite know what their experience was, regardless of if you experienced it simultaneously together. Mm. Um, the, uh, sometimes people use such uh, like you're able to, such eloquence in your in your vocabulary and, and in uh, sharing a concept that I just like I feel like I just need to let that kind of just sink in for a moment so I, I hope everybody again just does does themselves a favor and just really like sits with what Brian shared today on the, through the entire hour like there's this is one that I really want you all to just listen to again because I guarantee the more you listen to this the more that you just you can grab something, you're going to get something from this first listen. But when you listen again, you listen again, you're just going to, it's going to go deeper. You're just going to, you're going to hear, because Brian is packing a ton into literally every sentence he's sharing. And I really want everyone to get the gold that's in there. So 
Uh, thank you for sharing that story. I really do appreciate it. Appreciate thank you for asking. I, I, that's actually when I don't tell it that often. And so I appreciate that question because it's also another way to honor my mom and, and her experience through all of this. You, you know, I was just I was thinking about your mom as you were sharing that, uh, again, as a parent and, and your affinity for being a dad, I feel that as well. And I just, you know, her journey, like how to watch my son, like I just thinking about that and, and what it must have been from her point of view to watch what you were going through and to want to take away your pain and want to want to just take away that experience and then to support you through the rehabs and all like whatever it took to get back. I just like, I just really want to give a shout out to your mom. So um, my, my mom, my dad, and my brother deserve a lot of credit. I wouldn't be here without the three of them. And so, yes, thank you for coming, pausing to, to say that about my mom. I had to throw in their two names too, if we're going to take that second. Everybody um, deserves, I, yeah. Cause I, cause I, cause I wouldn't be here without the three of them. I mean, there's just, it's just a fact I wouldn't be. And, um, and so I'm, I'm deeply grateful and forever indebted for all the sacrifices they made um, to help me on my journey. Yeah. So beautiful. I know we've just scratched the surface. It is uh, one of those times I wish we had Joe Rogan style and we could just go for three or four, three or four hours. But this is a beautiful starting point uh, into our community getting to know you and a little bit of what's possible, the mission and vision that you're holding. Where can people get more of you and more of the amazing things that you're offering? If you are a social media person, I'm at Bogert Brian on any platform. If you're a web person, I'm brianbogert.com and you'll see a whole lot of entry into lots of the things that we're doing. Um, and you know what? We're here to truly elevate and empower people all the way around us. And so if there's a way that we can add value to you, we have a ton of free resources. Uh, we, don't gam, we, don't, we don't gain people, we don't funnel people. We truly are here to give. So if there's a way that we can add value into your world, please let us know. And uh, again, the more people we move, the faster we get to the collective impact of a billion lives. It's beautiful. I, you know, I always like to say it's one of my favorite things about living in this uh, day and age is technology allows all of us to be in Brian's world, wherever we are on the planet. 24-7, uh, he puts a ton of great content out, a lot of free res resources. There's literally no excuse not to have more of Brian in your world starting right now. So um, we'll put all those in the show notes, but do yourself a favor get connected in one way or another, take advantage of some of the free material he puts out there and start to start, you know, start up leveling your own journey into, into yourself and just allowing yourself to experience um, joy, freedom and fulfillment at a whole other level. So uh, in a sec, in a moment, Brian, I'm gonna ask if you have any final words for our audience. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna just genuinely thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, I was really looking forward to having you on the show. And more than that, I'm just really grateful for the example that you are in the world of, of what's possible when we say yes to doing the inner work. Uh, I just really feel that you exemplify uh, that journey. Um, you have a, a very a dramatic uh, experience, but in our own way, as you've mentioned very clearly, we all have our own stories, but you are, you are, you are a walking invitation for us to, to get really engaged and go on that journey for ourselves. So thank you for being you. Any final words for our audience? Well, I, I want to take just a second and say thank you, because if you hadn't built a platform for me to pour good in the world, we wouldn't have this opportunity today. And so thank you. I also want to thank you for not only your time and attention to actually putting in research to figure out how to make this the most meaningful hour that we could have together, but that absolutely showed because you also showed up with an open heart and an open mind and you asked very good questions that actually took me on a few different paths than I've been on in a little while. And so Jeff, thank you, because that uh, I've been on a lot of these things. I've been on a lot of podcasts and I will tell you that uh, I, I genuinely really enjoyed the dialogue back and forth. And I can tell that you're a living example to really be able to show people what's possible as well. So I just wanted to pause and say, thank you for that. Appreciate um, you know, you say, do I want to leave with the last few words? And I, I know that you asked me earlier if there was anything that was on my heart um, that I really wanted to share. And I, I told you something, but I'm actually not going to take it there because in this moment, it feels different. Uh, I've, I've said this before to other people, but it, it just feels right right now based on what you said with the invitation to go inward. I think there's a lot of people out there that are waiting for a savior. They're waiting for somebody to come in and literally just take all their problems away. They're waiting for somebody to give them the solution, the strategy or the tactics that's going to let them live the life that they say they desire. And I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news because I feel like I pour so much positivity into people's lives but this is a perspective that I want everybody to walk away with. Nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. And that doesn't mean they don't care, but there is nobody outside of you that can save you, that can help you. But the thing I want to remind everybody who's listening to this, 
no matter how hard it is for you right now, no matter how hard it's been in different periods of your life, no matter what, you're here. The fact that you're listening to this or watching this or however you're consuming these words and this conversation, you exist on this planet today, which means you are a survivor. You've made it this far, which also means that whatever you've accomplished, whatever you've overcome will give you the power, the perspective, and the purpose to continue to move forward, regardless of what else is coming. So if you don't know where to begin, you don't know how to go on that journey for yourself, you don't know how to remove some of the negativity, the resistance, and the energy drain that exists in your world, start asking questions and look for a guide. There is no hero, there is no savior, but there's many guides. And again, that's not a pitch for a coach. That could be your spouse, that could be your kids, that could be your parents, that could be your business partner, that could be your best friend, that could be anybody that's in your world. Just ask questions and be open to receive the feedback that they have. Be open to receive the help they can give you to guide you on your path. But you, and only you, are your own savior, are your own hero. So please, put in the work. Go on the internal journey. You will not only free yourself, but you will find a way to allow your truth to give others permission to live theirs and free others on your way. Thank you, Jeff. Mm, so beautiful. Um, I want to thank you again, Brian. Obviously, that's uh, that's the best way I've ever uh, heard anyone explain that we're the ones we're waiting for. Like we are all the ones that we're waiting for. That was beautiful. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. I want to thank everybody who's with us week in and week out. I'm Jeff Bider, your host, reminding you that you're awesome and that the world is a better place with you in it and that you were absolutely designed to be enjoying success. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.